So let's continue. Uh, so we don't have to spend the night. So basically, as, as, as we've heard from, from Ines as well, uh, the, the relationships between climate and climate impacts, uh, the potential for damage and uh, the cost of limiting emissions need to be balanced. In order to be able to do that, uh, we need to understand what the effects of climate phenomena are and how we can quantify them, how we can translate them into actionable items. And what I will do now is, is give you different climate effects, different global change effects that have always existed, but that are uh, getting more important. And in order to be able to act on them, we need to measure them, we need to classify them, and so on. So everybody knows what a drought is. It's a dry spell. But how long, how deep, how dry, what's the effect? And uh, even with a relatively simple thing like drought, uh, there are several classifications. Obviously, a drought is the absence of rainfall. So the first concept is the meteorological drought, which can be measured by the lack of rainfall, the duration of that lack of day, uh, rainfall, i.e. the precipitation shortfall over a normal precipitation, and that is already a problem, but you need to define them normal. If there's not enough rainfall, agriculture is one of the first things to suffer. So agricultural drought is the effect of a meteorological drought, but it's a little bit more complicated because obviously most plants don't get their moisture from the atmosphere. They get their moisture from the soil. So the soil storage of moisture is something that needs to be taken into consideration when we talk about agricultural drought. If uh, I lived many years in, 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 in Western Canada where the rainfall is not sufficient for crop production, and farmers would do something called summer fallowing. For one year, they would not grow anything. The rain would fall, would be stored in the soil, and they would use that moisture in the coming year for the next crop. That doesn't work with all soils, doesn't work in all climates, but it works in Saskatchewan. So an agricultural drought the, uh, depends on the plant water demand. If you have a very demanding uh, crop system, region, uh, it, is, it is more severe or will uh, occur more frequently. It depends on, on soil moistures as well as uh, on the uh, rainfall. Hydrological drought is when the rivers run dry, basically. Now, obviously, the rivers run dry uh, a little later than the lack of rainfall because they're getting recharged from groundwater. They're getting recharged from the landscape. So, uh, invariably, the uh, hydrological drought has a lag period to the meteorological drought. And it is sometimes very, very difficult if you have a huge watershed like uh, La, the La Plata Basin, where central Brazil, uh, the Bolivian highlands, part of Argentina, even Sao Paulo State, the, the, uh, uh, the Tieté a River here in Sao Paulo, ends up in Montevideo. That watershed goes from, from, from the Tieté. The Tieté is the first river. If you go a little bit further, to the north, uh, the Paraíba River it flows into a different direction. The Tieté is the first river that ends up in the La Plata in the south. So obviously, a hydrological drought uh, in, in a large basin like this can have lag periods of months. In a smaller basin, it will only be a few days. If you irrigate, you need uh, the water from the river or groundwater and uh, in order to compensate for a shortfall of uh, rainfall and that links agricultural drought with uh, hydrological drought and uh, meteorological drought but it's a development process it's a social process 
So when uh, there is a preponderance of irrigated agriculture in a region, like for instance uh, there was under Soviet times in Uzbekistan, uh, the droughty conditions of the region would be compensated for by more and more and more irrigation, which finally after 20 or 30 years of Soviet agriculture totally destroyed the soils and salinized the soils in Uzbekistan. So these processes, we, we already see in a simple, comp a simple system like drought that uh, there are interactions between landscape, climate, land use, land cover, development, choices, type of agriculture, and so on. And then finally, we translate this into the social and economic impact, which may be years later or maybe immediate if it's in Ethiopia, Sometimes uh, meteorological drought is felt immediately, particularly in society, uh, societies that live of livestock, because livestock depends on the plant growth at the moment, and if you're in a semi-arid system, the absence of rainfall will cause a uh, socioeconomic drought that is immediate. So a simple concept we need to keep in mind it's, it's not the same if we're in Ethiopia or in, in Sao Paulo or in the northeast of Brazil or in a large basin uh, with large amounts of water available in rivers, etc. Temperature change. I'm, I'm going just jumping from topic to topic here uh, to give you some idea of the complexity. There are some effects. Uh, I said that average temperatures really aren't very meaningful. But there are large zones around the globe where average temperatures do have an effect. Imagine that you're moving into Patagonia or through the North American plains closer to the poles. If you're at the pole, it's frozen most of the time. If you're in New Orleans, or in Buenos Aires, it doesn't freeze ever. Somewhere in between there is a zone where there's a lot of cycling of freezing and thawing, of freezing and thawing. And, and those are zones, and that, those freeze-thaw cycles have a tremendous impact on what vegetation is possible in the region, what trees will survive, uh, what crops can be grown, how the soil can be worked. Uh, very often even what type of soil you find in the area. So the maximum zone of, of freeze-thaw cycles in North America is approximately the U.S.-Canada border. If you go further to the south, it's a little bit too warm. It stays uh, uh, thawed or it stays above zero more. If you go further to the north, it stays below zero four. And that is the zone where there's the maximum uh, freeze-thaw cycles. So... When you go into this region, you will see a tremendous absence of trees. I, I once went out into, into that area of, of North America with a forester from Kenya, and he said, this is wonderful. I only have to learn three new species. In Kenya, we have 300 tree species. And it's true because there's only three tree species that can survive that fluctuation of freeze-thaw cycles. Similarly, the cropping systems need to uh, adapt to these freeze-thaw cycles. The mineralization of soil organic matter is accelerated by freeze-thaw cycles. So the emissions of <coughs> nitrogen from the soil, the availability of nutrients to agriculture, the need for supplemental uh, fertilization, the uh, possibility of applying a fertilizer in the fall when that fertilizer needs to go through all the freeze-thaw cycles versus having to do it just at seeding time when there may not be a lot of time available. All these are aspects of land management that are directly affected by mean temperature changes and the shifts of freeze-thaw cycles. And in a moment, I'll come back uh, to, a, uh, to an example of that. And, of course, technical structures. Uh, concrete, freezing and thawing concrete, is an engineer's nightmare. So uh, very many uh, uh, cultural and agricultural activities are directly affected by where this zone of freezing and thawing is on the continent. Uh, if 
you have a lot of freeze thaw cycles or if you have a lot of warm spells in a period, frost hardening uh, is reduced. That kills trees. That's why in those zones there are only very few tree species that survive. But it also will, ki uh, will kill winter crops. Winter wheat is the main wheat that is being grown in, in, in much of, of Central and Northern Europe. Is is uh, also grown extensively in North America. It is seeded at the beginning of the winter, and it can survive down to about minus 20, 22 degrees centigrade, uh, even sprouted already, if it has enough time to acclimatize to these low temperatures. The freeze-thaw cycles that happen in between, that wheat will die. If these freeze-thaw uh, freeze cycles uh, mean that any snow that has fallen, any snow cover that would protect the wheat melts, that wheat will definitely die. So uh, these, these are immediate and direct effects that very small shifts in mean temperatures and, and the fluctuations around the mean temperatures will have. And the frost sensitivity of plants is actually being made worse by higher CO2 contents in the atmosphere. CO2 causes the climate change, but the CO2 is also uh, affecting the plants directly. The effect of CO2 fertilization, and I'll come back to that, is CO2 makes plants uh, more effective and grow better. So people have said for a long time, oh, well, if, there, if there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, we, the plants will grow better, and in terms of total outcome for agriculture, it, it uh, uh, will be neutral or maybe even positive. So frost damage is an important factor when temperatures rise, which, which sounds absurd, but it is the case in, in those regions where much of agriculture and, uh, is happening, and particularly where much of the export agriculture for the international wheat market and corn market is happening. Uh, this is, a, is an event that happened in uh, uh, 2007 in Missouri. Uh, there was a particularly strong early spring warming and then uh, a freeze, freeze, freeze spell moved across the region and basically killed back the vegetation. This is a normal year. This is the year with this additional freeze-thaw cycle. And this is a, a, a reconstructed satellite map. The, the lines you see here are state boundaries, so you get a notion of the huge area that is being affected. Uh, in the pre-freeze, which was an exceptionally warm period, you see this is all dark green, <coughs> which, which is the, uh, an NVD, N, N, NDVI measurement, i.e., it represents the greenness and, and the sprouting of the trees and so on. Then came the post-freeze, and all of that vegetation died back. The leaves dropped and browned off, and it didn't recover. In a normal year, uh, at, at the time of spring, there would be not much vegetation growth. It would start later in the year, but then it would persist throughout the season. So this is a huge area, a huge setback to forestry. Uh, we don't even talk yet about uh, fruit production and things like that. I was in the uh, uh, Quebrada in northwestern um, Argentina a few uh, months ago, <coughs> and uh, the uh, production of apricot, which this region is famous for, that year hadn't happened at all. The entire region had lost the entire production of apricots because there was a fluctuation of temperatures, the trees started flowering, then a frost came, and the production was wiped out. So these are uh, climate change effects that are happening already now, and the multiplicity of these effects is uh, what societies need uh, to deal with. And the example that I was going to give is, is the University of Illinois Extension Service is worrying as climate changes, the, the springs are a little warmer, they're a little wetter. If you have a wet spring and you drive your tractor in the field, uh, chances are your tractor, tractor will get stuck. Also, you cannot prepare a seedbed. 
So you, you can no longer seed at the time that the farmer is, is uh, used to seed. At the same time, the summers and the late summers particularly are hotter and drier, and the drought conditions will reduce the uh, productivity of the maize that is grown in the region. So between the squeeze on the spring <coughs> field working days and the squeeze on the maturity uh, period of, of, the, of the maize, there is a serious production limitation. And in all likelihood, and this is already happening here, new maize cultivars are needed uh, to keep producing in that region of the United States and that's a reality of today. That's not in 50 years, that's not in 100 years. That is a concern right now. So climate change and its effect are with us. <clears throat> now, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on, on Climate Change, uh, has developed language based on scenarios and on the models that Ines referred to. And uh, basically... Uh, they talk about likelihoods. It's something is very likely, it's likely, it's not likely, medium confidence in the, in the outputs and so on. And it's obvious, they say, fewer cold and more warm days is some effect of climate change. That's perfectly understandable. And that's very likely uh, at the global scale. When we apply the models, it's also likely under the climatic conditions of North America, uh, Europe, and Australia. But for much of Asia, uh, we only have medium confidence in, in some of those trends. So there are differences between the continents, between the capacity of the models to model a continent, but also the effects of the size of the continent, the heights of the mountains, the kinds of weather systems that are there, particularly for Asia, because there is very low confidence in predictions of such phenomena as the monsoon, which determines large areas of, of uh, productivity and rainfall and climate or temperature and, and uh, moisture regime in, in Asia, but also of El Nino. The discussion we've all had, or we've all have seen the discussions on, is El Nino stronger now? Is it more frequent now? Uh, it's, it's, there are extreme El Ninos every 10 or so years. Uh, the effects are very strong, but to, to have <coughs> adequate statistics and adequate modeling uh, for such events as El Nino is very, very difficult. El Nino as a whole is modeled reasonably well by the climate systems, but whether it's a central or an eastern uh, uh, El Nino it's almost impossible to predict. And it's the eastern El Ninos that have the effect, as we've seen over the last six, seven months, that have the largest effect on South American climate. And again, there are, there are many disconnects still in terms of where we can make confident or less confident predictions. Uh, tropical cyclone activity. Yes, cyclone intensity depends on how much energy a cyclone can suck out of a warming sea. But uh, the details, uh, the physics, are still not fully known. And the uh, historical reconstructions, for instance, show that with a warmer North Atlantic, cyclone activity may not be necessarily greater in the Caribbean, but the courses will be translated more towards the south. Now, it so happens that the last major cyclone hit an area that normally doesn't get hit, Nicaragua, the south of Central America. Normally, they're way, way further, further to the north and hit Cuba and the islands every time there's a cyclone. But now, it, it so happens, but we, of course, because it's individual extreme events, it's very difficult to look for trends at this stage. But these possibilities, and that's why the scenarios and the modeling is important, <clears throat> because we're looking about... Uh, uh, we're looking at possibilities and of, of future events. So if we compare these scenarios, and, and that's the other approach, uh, with the actual events. Between 2000 and 2008, Asia as a whole had the greatest number of climate-related uh, disasters. Now, Asia is also the largest land mass 
of all the continents if we divide North and South America into two different ones. So uh, it, it may be meaningful, it may not be uh, meaningful. The highest impact in terms of uh, uh, economic losses was in the Americas, uh, principally because of one or two major events. Katrina caused a huge amount of damage in a very uh, fairly highly populated and uh, populated with lots of money and lots of infrastructure in the US. Uh, after that comes Asia and, and Europe, much less so. Africa, again, we had the discussion this morning, shows at the very bottom of the scale, <clears throat> partly, uh, of course, because large regions of Africa don't contain a lot of infrastructure that could get damaged. Uh, uh, in, if you go into an area like Acapulco in, in Mexico, uh, there was a hurricane that hit in 2002 or three, and did a lot of damage, several million damage. There was a very similar size hurricane that made landfall there in the 50s, and two fishing huts got blown away because the hotels weren't there yet. So uh, there were interactions of vulnerabilities as people move to the coast and develop the coastal areas. So uh, measuring the impact of climate events is something very important for political decision making. Economic losses obviously are higher in those countries where there's a lot of infrastructure that can be destroyed. Fatalities and percent GDP uh, reduction is much greater in a country like Nicaragua. So uh, the, the impact on a country like Nicaragua from an extreme event is uh, much greater in, in relative terms, even though the total cash value is not the same. And it's probably not a coincidence that Nicaragua is one of the countries that didn't sign the Paris Agreement because they thought it didn't go far enough. Nicaragua had just been hit by a hurricane and destroyed by a hurricane with huge losses, percentage losses, to its own GDP. <clears throat> so doing these statistics depends on local conditions, on available data, and uh, also uh, as, as we look at uh, more extreme climate, uh, one of the critical concepts are the return periods. We get a 100-year rainfall, means the probability of getting a rainfall of that intensity and so much precipitation at a time is once in a 100 years. The problem that much of humanity faces today is that these 100-year rainfalls now have a 20-year 20 uh, 20 return period or something of the sort. So it's, it's uh, extreme events uh, happened since biblical times. I mean, they've been, the floods of the Bible have been written up a long time ago. Obviously, there were events there that led to them being written up. But the return period uh, is, is the critical notion that we will need to deal with in the future. And it's also a matter of perception. Uh, you go into northern Norway, and the temperature in Narvik uh, is going up to 12 or 15 degrees at the height of summer, and everybody walks in the street in shorts and sandals because it is so hot. Obviously, a heat wave in northern Norway uh, or Sweden has different dimensions than a heat wave in Buenos Aires, or in southern Spain. So the, the, the local sensitivities and the preparedness uh, is, is very different. In the uh, 2003 heat wave uh, in, uh, was it three? I think it was three. In, in France, a lot of people died. Uh, many fewer died in Spain because they were used to these temperatures and old people didn't go out and, and they kept their shutters closed and, and they opened the windows only at night and so on. So depending on, on the adaptation, the natural adaptation and the newly learned adaptation of societies, the impact by, of these extreme events uh, vary. Adaptation, uh, question is, what kind of disease control mechanisms do we have in place for outbreaks of 
uh, tropical or subtropical diseases. If you go into Buenos Aires now, you see posters on dengue. Ten years ago, there was no such thing because it hadn't arrived. Uh, uh, Uruguay had, ha, has had its first endogenous case of dengue uh, uh, this, uh, earlier this year. So uh, uh, these, these tropical and subtropical diseases are spreading. The question is, how are we adapting or are adapted to these? What is our urban design? How much ventilation is possible? How much have we concentrated in putting concrete blocks and narrow streets into big cities so that the only way to keep cool is air conditioning and then your electricity grid fails? So these are all considerations that uh, uh, are beyond the purely climatic incidence of an extreme event and climate change, but that are intricately connecting development stage, uh, civil engineering, urban design, infrastructures, and so on and so on with climate events. So, and, and less extreme events can have tremendous impact. In the late 90s, early 2000s, much of Quebec suddenly was in the dark. And all that happened was that the rain that was falling from a warm air fell through a layer of cold air, so it froze before it hit the ground. But it didn't only hit the ground, but it also hit the power lines. And the ice was building up on the power lines, and the weight was building up on the power lines, and the power lines broke. A almost normal event, not a big deal at all. But much of Quebec had a huge bill on repair and, and lost energy, and people were left without electricity in a cold part of the year, which is an uncomfortable situation to be in. So I think um, in, in terms of your discussions, uh, maybe later today, but certainly tomorrow, uh, you need to wrap your mind around what can be measured what can be predicted? What are the tools of prediction? Are there models? Are there extrapolation of current events, of current climates? Are they, many years ago when I was working in northern Ghana, uh, uh, in, in the savannah zone of, Ga zone of, of, of Ghana, I had a, a student come uh, to do his field work, and he came from the south, and people from the south in Ghana don't like to go to the north. So I asked him, why are you here? And he said, well, with climate change, what I'm learning in the semi-arid north now, I will apply further south in 20 years. And in a way, he was right. Uh, so it's, it's, can, we, can we translate the lessons of one region of the world to another region of the world? Can we go to a semi-arid region where climate variability is already a problem? And can we apply that to another region where it may be a problem in the future? These are all questions that, that need to be addressed scientifically and in terms of understanding. And experiences are important there. Uh, in, in one uh, meeting of scientists, I asked ecologists uh, to make some kind of a prediction. And they said, no, don't, we won't do that because we don't have certainty of our knowledge. And, and I, until I am certain of my results, I will not make a prediction. Well, time has run out for looking for absolute truth and certainties. We now, as scientists, have to learn a little bit to do this. This will work, in my opinion. And if you get 10 scientists doing this, and all 10 si and thumbs do that at the same time, your probability of being right is pretty decent. So uh, I, I think uh, we need to get away from uh, the philosophical search for absolute truth within science and produce a science that produces answers quicker, maybe not with 100% reliability, but nothing is 100% reliable in, uh, in life. Social perceptions are, are important. When do we have a crisis? What can we cope with? And what are the vulnerabilities? And are these vulnerabilities equally distributed between rich and poor? between people who have a shack by the side of a river or have a mansion on the hill. And this brings us 
so the, these are these are themes that for the discussion later on you need to keep in mind and keep them in mind as we go through the following slides as well what is climate change just simply increasing temperature we know that there's a variability of climate right now we got days that are cold we got days that are hot and most days are somewhere in the middle so do we shift all of this or is it a matter of at the same time getting more days out at the extremes i.e. the variability increases and in all likelihood climate change will take in most regions that kind of form where there will be a shift towards warmer conditions all around but also an increase in the variability and if that is the case at the low end extreme events will no longer happen so much it won't be quite as extreme but at the high end we will see more extreme events and shifts in the average and the analysis that I will present later on on agriculture is basically looking at this scenario average shifts and more extreme hot events uh, going back to the modeling this is a model prediction for France the temperature anomaly uh, that is predicted for the future in other words uh, if we go way down <coughs> to, to the 80s uh, and into the next century, the mean will be outside the current extremes. And how much adaptation the society has to go through uh, to cope with that, we know from the 2003 heat wave. So the hottest summer in France was in 2003, this was the heat wave, was at about three and a half degrees above the mean. Put this in the context of the discussion before, one and a half versus two degrees versus the actual prediction somewhere in the threes uh, if we honor the Paris agreements. The average for that period is predicted to be that much higher. So we're shifting the whole vulnerability scale to that. And the extreme events could be up to 10 degrees above. So what will happen in some regions based on a shift towards warmer as well as an increase of the variability can be very, very extreme indeed. And that's at looking at means of three, we're looking at extremes of 10 degrees. How do we identify those extremes? What is extreme? We can count the number of record break, breaking events and then examine the trends. Does it get more in one year from one year to the next year, from one decade to the next decade? Uh, but then we also have to eliminate or distinguish between the cold events that probably are not as frequent anymore, the extreme events on, on, the, on the warm side, and we haven't considered rainfall yet. Or we can use multiple indicators, droughts, temperatures. Uh, uh, one, of the, one of the measures that is being used quite commonly is the number of tropical nights. Uh, for instance, in southern um, Paraguay, uh, in Encarnacion, the number of tropical nights above 25 degrees has more than tripled over the last 10 years. And that's very important if you want to have a decent night of sleep or, or don't want to switch on your air conditioner <coughs> to emit even more CO2. So tropical nights, the incidence of tropical nights above 25 degrees would be one, uh, one of these indicators. And we can combine a number of these indicators into uh, an index, and we can use that index. or we can do something totally different, as I said, and look at effects down the road, i.e. insurance payouts. Uh, and that is uh, a statistic that's been used very widely uh, on the effects of extreme events, hurricanes, 
blow down by, by wind events, uh, uh, damage by flooding, and so on. Insurance payouts over the last 50 years have increased tremendously, and particularly in the last 10 years. You have to subtract from that the wealth creation during that period because there's more infrastructure to be uh, destroyed by extreme events, so you have to adjust those numbers. None of these calculations are quite straightforward. And the problem with all of these, of course, is that the extremer the event, the rarer it probably is. And uh, therefore, the, the ones that have the greatest impact, like a Katrina, are the most difficult to quantify. Will we be looking at 10 Katrinas uh, per, per decade or per 100 years in the future? It's going to be almost impossible to predict. In that whole mess, there are some straightforward relationships, and that is physics. Uh, for every degree increase in temperature, the air can hold in absolute amounts 7% more moisture. Simple. Uh, relative moisture content ch doesn't change there, right, because the relative co moisture content is the relative content to 100% at which point it either forms a fog or starts to rain out. So these are relative numbers, and what we norm normally measure is relative moisture. But the absolute moisture content in warmer air is greater, and the relationship is straightforward physics, 7% per degree. And in fact, between uh, the 70s and the 2000s, the absolute moisture content increased because the average temperature increased. The relative, temp uh, the relative moisture content did not increase. The more moisture there is in the atmosphere, there's a disturbance. If a warm front hits a cold front, more moisture will fall out of the atmosphere. Rainfall intensity will be greater, and that's what we're seeing all over the world now. One phenomenon that's, that's, uh, is, is, is pretty frightening, and that if you, if you look at the news, France, Italy, uh, Pakistan, Germany, uh, Argentina, they all have seen summer storms like they always occurred. I mean, you know these summer storms where it just starts bucketing. And they always lasted 10 minutes or 5 or 14. Now they last 50 or an hour. And areas that where people weren't even aware that there was once a riverbed suddenly turn into rivers and wipe away whole villages. That's a phenomenon that, that has increased tremendously over the last five years. Before that time, I hadn't seen any. Again, how statistically significant is that? It's a multitude of events that accumulate to tell us climate change is with us and is here now. Let's look at agriculture. As somebody mentioned this morning, you can't eat your GDP, uh, but you need food to eat, and agriculture is the route to that. And agriculture is highly dependent on temperatures and on rainfall. So there has been a negative yield response uh, to increased growing season temperatures that's been recorded for a long time now. Uh, in fact, there was this puzzling thing happening <clears throat> to agricultural productivity. After the Green Revolution, there was a jump up, and then it keep moving up and up and up a little bit because of technological advances, because of genetic advances. And those increases were getting less and less and less. And people were wondering, why is it? Are the soils getting exhausted and so on? And it's probably also climate change. There is now, uh, if you do the statistics, a clear relationship to growing season temperatures and <coughs> crop production. If you look at those numbers for uh, wheat, maize, and barley, the uh, losses are globally 40 million tons per year, or 5 billion US dollars per year. Those are the losses that we've been seeing over the uh, previous 20-year period. So we're even higher now. 
those are the real numbers on actual today climate change in terms of agricultural productivity. What happens is, as I said, this graph is the reduction in yield increases. Uh, there was, because of technological advances, because of seeding technology, of genetic improvements, improved weed management, all the technologies that go into improving agriculture, there has been an increase in yields over the last century that was quite tremendous. <clears throat> Since the 70s, these yield increases, and here these very high increases initially, are largely due to the Green Re uh, Revolution uh, in the 60s. Uh, they have now gone very, very low. And we have counteracting to the technological advances the negative effects of climate change. Again, not a clear relationship because technology is improving. The improvements are getting less. The investment in, in agricultural improvement is staying more or less the same, and we're getting less return for that investment. That goes hand in hand with the temperature increase. Well, this population increase is not quite as straightforward as that, but on a global scale, it's more or less likely. But if we break this down now into regions, we can see regions of greater and lesser susceptibility. So the effect of climate change is unevenly distributed. While northern North America and northern Europe are actually benefiting possibly from climate change, Africa, southern North America, and so much of South America except for the southern tip are certainly not benefiting. And it depends on the kind of agriculture that you have. Chile is not a great producer of soybeans and grains. It's a producer of, of, of wine and, and fruits for export and, and vegetables for export. So they see negative impacts, while the rest of the southern cone sees uh, positive impacts. Uh, the temperature increases <coughs> uh, are, we've seen the maps before. There are various uh, shapes and forms of these things. and. Uh, uh, they are also unevenly distributed, but in terms of the social impact, that is what we need to look at because it translates into risk of food security. And Africa and India and Pakistan do not look good uh, when we aggregate these numbers into food security. Now, these maps are very nice. They're very pretty. They're colored. We can even put them in a newspaper, but I think if you think back about the last 10 minutes of my talk, how many calculations, assumptions, combinations of things you have to put together by the time you arrive at such a map, be critical of all these things that you see. They're not as straightforward and as pretty when you dissect them and look at the content of truth. One of the uh, things that I mentioned Previously is the CO2 fertilization. Uh, roughly for a 1 ppm increase of CO2, there's a 0.1% increase in yield. Uh, that's simply because photosynthesis captures uh, energy from the sun, picks up CO2. That CO2 is converted into starch and into uh, vegetable matter. And like any chemical reaction, if you con if you increase the concentration of the reactants, you improve the chances of that reaction moving forward into the product. So it's straightforward biochemistry or chemistry. With more CO2, chances are <clears throat> you end up with, with uh, uh, more fixed carbon in the plant. Particularly for C3 crops, C4 crops have a slightly different metabolism, and they don't show quite that a response. So for the 35 ppm increase that we've seen, 3.5% yield increase is what we would expect. But at the same time, higher temperatures cause a decrease. And the increase and decrease have basically canceled each other out. And whenever anybody has said 50 years ago or 40 years ago that we will have improved agricultural production, 
because of CO2 increases in the atmosphere. That's not quite true. In addition, uh, the, the uh, additional fixed CO2 <clears throat> results in a different plant composition. And very often the experience from phase experiments, from the CO2 experiments that are done in open fields, is that the insect damage and the disease damage to CO2 fertilized plants is greater than to normal plants. As, as a result, uh, we're looking at 19 million tons of wheat, 12 million tons of, of maize, and 8 million tons of barley. If you add them all up, you come up with the 40 million that I showed before. And then somebody got the idea and went to all the research stations on all the data uh, for all of Africa and looked at the maize yields that were recorded in fertilization trials, in variety trials, and so on, and reanalyzed all of that. And uh, Lobel is, oh, by the way, down here, these, if you ever want to look up these, I, I will put some of the literature on the web page when I figure out where, where it should be put. But these are the authors of the uh, uh, information that I'm giving. So for each de degree day above 30 degrees, there was a reduction of 1% in yield. And when it was in, on top of that droughty, the reduction was close to 2%. Now, we, we, we have a tremendous problem with predicting drought. Uh, uh, and rainfall uh, under climate change conditions. But one thing is clear, for a plant, <clears throat> if the temperature is higher, if there's any drought, the drought will be more severe because there will be more moisture lost from the system. So these effects are already there. This is a reanalysis. This is not a model. That's important. Reanalysis of trials from the past that already show the effect of climate change on African maize production. Let's try and, and, and look at some of the biochemistry and figure out why is this. Is this all magic because the plants don't feel too well when it's getting too hot? And the reason why I, I go into some of the enzyme actions and so on now is because when we set a limit of 1.5 degrees or of 2 degrees, what do we expect? A linear effect of temperature, a curvature effect, threshold effects, um, effects when, where, we, where we lose permanently that are not reversible. And looking at some of the basic underlying mechanisms will provide us with some of the answers. So the first uh, concept that you need to understand is something that I just mentioned two slides earlier, the growing degree days. Uh, growing degree days is a concept used in agriculture that is basically the a product of the days and the temperature above the line when growth is possible. So if you come out of a winter, obviously at minus two growth, it doesn't happen. If you grow tomatoes, they start growing only at about 12 or 15 degrees. Below 15 degrees, you have no growing degree days for tomatoes. And depending on the crop and depending on the climate, these things vary. It's a concept that relates the performance of any particular crop to the availability of high, te high enough temperature to grow. That was 20 years ago. Now we have a new variant of this, which is called the thermal kinetic window. And that thermal kinetic window is putting the concept of degree days, which was only looking at the lower threshold, is also starting to look at the upper threshold. Because we have increasing incidents where crops that are grown somewhere are hitting a higher limit for their growth. And that's climate change, because obviously, if you have barley that grows in northern Poland and in Sweden, and you, nobody would, in their right mind, would try and grow that in Africa. 
or in uh, Brazil. So the crops that are distributed around the globe are distributed in a way that uh, people have learned over the centuries to live with their climate and are adapted to that climate. What is happening now is that in situ, where these crops are and where that adaptation has happened, we're starting to hit the upper limit, not just the lower limit. <clears throat> so basically, uh, the, the uh, uh, thermal kinetic window for most crops is somewhere above 30 or 35 degrees. Above that, uh, they don't like growing anymore. What happens at that point? Cell membranes have lipids in them. What happens when you take olive oil out of the fridge? It was pretty thick in the fridge, and it gets very liquid outside the fridge. If you take Dendé, it's even worse. Uh, so. The, ch the same change that you see in the bottle of oil is happening in the plant membranes. And the plant needs to adapt to that and produce more saturated fatty acids in order to maintain its rigidity and its physiological function. The enzymes that are uh, uh, responsible for fixing CO2 and turning it into starch their kinetic rates are reduced. Plants produce heat shock proteins. And in fact, one of the breeding uh, attempts right now in many of the countries of the world is to uh, produce plants that are better at producing heat shock proteins so they would be more adapted to future climates. People are already tinkering with the biochemistry and the, with the genetics of the plants in order to make them uh, more resistant to higher temperatures. Heat stress introduces the, uh, increases the nitrogen content uh, because there is less carbon fixation, but the nitrogen constant, uh, content stays about the same. You also get heat shock proteins being produced that have nitrogen content. <coughs> so the nitrogen content changes. Now, that may be positive because, for instance, in wheat, a high nitrogen content wheat is, is a good wheat, is a high quality wheat that has a high market price, but the protein uh, is slightly different. So in terms of baking quality, in fact, you're not seeing any improvements. Uh, if it's barley and you have a higher nitrogen content, your beer will turn out cloudy and you won't be able to sell it. So it's a disaster. For barley, malting barley has to have a very low protein content. So again, it, depending on the crop, these heat effects can be positive, negative, neutral, and the local granularity is, is going to be uh, extremely important. And at very high temperatures, reproduction itself is curtailed. This is, i just throw this in here. This is a very famous uh, equation that looks at the uh, rate of enzyme reactions and basically, uh, the michaelis menten uh, constant here is a constant that tells us uh, what substrate concentration do I need to uh, achieve half the maximum rate of CO2 fixation or of starch production or any one of these processes. And I, I only put this on here because it's a curve. So we already know that the reactivity of the system to increasing temperatures when it is modified through enzyme activity will not be a linear process. So we cannot expect, even on the most basic assumptions of the enzymes active in plants, a linear response to climate change and to temperature effects. So the nonlinear function is what we will expect. All plants have something like this in terms of biochemical reaction rates. When it's cold, little happens. Temperature increase, reaction rate increases. Temperature increases further, and it drops off. Somewhere around 30 degrees, 
for very many regions of the world, that somewhere around 30 degrees are typical summer temperatures. So whether you're at 28 or 34, in terms of the biochemistry, suddenly becomes very, very important. And that is really the underlying mechanism for our concern for agriculture and food security when we talk about uh, uh, climate change. That limit, 30 degrees to 40 degrees, is where all the bad things happen. In addition uh, to the enzyme activity, phytohormones change. Abscisic acid, salicylic acid, and ethylene are increased at higher temperatures. Do you know what ethylene is used for in agricultural production? Speeding up maturity. You put a bunch of bananas in a boat, seal them in, pump the container full of ethylene, and when they arrive at the other end, they're yellow. Uh, so, ethylene is something that speeds up maturity. It also speeds up maturity in a living plant. And if you speed up these processes, there's less time available for growth. And these, uh, and therefore, ethylene has a very negative effect. Abscisic acid is something produced, as the name says, that causes abscission. And excess abscisic acid production can actually cause fruiting bodies to be upsized and drop off, i.e. no product, no seed, no fruit. These are effects of higher temperatures that, come, that become important above 35 degrees, between 35 and 40 degrees. So that's where we suddenly get to the thresholds. Before, we had curves of enzyme reactivities, but now when we actually change towards uh, uh, phytohormones that produce senescence, that cause abscission of reproductive or organs, even in tropical fruit trees that happens above 35 to 40 degrees, uh, we, we not only lose some of the yield, we may lose all of the yield. And while we use, lose some of the yield, the resulting seed will not be only be smaller, but will be less vigorous. So if we recycle that seed material for the next season to grow the next season's crop, we will have less of a crop in the following season. So the damage is propagated into future seasons. All phenological stages and phenological stages from seedling emergence to growth <clears throat> to anthesis when, when the reproductive uh, organs are being formed to the seed formation and finally to the senescence. All these phenological stages are temperature uh, sensitive. But the point of forming reproductive organs and seed filling later on are the most sensitive. And in fact, uh, we, we know uh, now that uh, grain number is being reduced tremendously. Northern India is a huge producer of wheat. They have had to change the growing season to earlier seeding because their yields were so negatively affected by the high summer temperatures that they have now, simply because during spikelet formation, during the period of reproduction, the sensitivity of the plant is the greatest, and it was wiping out their yields. So uh, as we move above that thermal kinetic window, for every one degree increase, we're looking at almost 10 degrees loss in yield, <clears throat> part of that due to smaller grains and part of it due to fewer grains. This is just from the initial through the vegetative reproductive phases, uh, we're looking at sensitivities. And this one, the mean daily temperature, or the, 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 the daytime temperature, is what determines reproductive health, in a way. The mean temperature, which includes nighttime and daytime temperature, is what 
uh, uh, determines growth performance. So all of these things we need to take into consideration when we start looking at climate change effects on crops. And that's what it looks like. Uh, this is a very typical pattern of a heat damaged uh, uh, cob of corn where some of the kernels are minute and shriveled and many of them are actually not filled at all or missing uh, totally. This is what you see uh, after a particularly hot summer if you go into a cornfield in, in Yucatan, southern Mexico, and uh, that's the damage you actually see in the field. And looking at many, many different trials, uh, people analyzed what component of weather or climate has what effect on our crops. Minimum temperature, maximum temperature, and precipitation. This is for wheat. So as the minimum temperature during a day or growing period rises, the yield of wheat drops tremendously. The maximum temperature doesn't even have quite as strong an effect. So the minimum temperature is important because of grain filling and things like that. The maximum temperature is important once we get to these thresholds of changing the biology significantly. With rice, of course we don't see this, and that's important because rice cools itself. It's got its feet in the water, and it can transpire. So that rice is much less sensitive, but of course, therefore, the more water is available, the more we can increase the yield. So rice is, is relatively less sensitive. Now, I took these three uh, on one here because this is a C3 plant and this is a C4 plant. The C4 plants are supposed to be like sugarcane more adapted to tropical conditions, to warmer conditions, have a greater capacity to capture CO2 with sunlight. But even with maize, both minimum and maximum temperature uh, have a negative yield effect. We can do the same thing for soybean. The minimum that is important, the maximum very important. Barley, a crop typical of the closer to polar regions, a huge effect, a very steep effect. And sorghum, something that does better in the tropics and in drier and warmer conditions, is, is somewhat less sensitive. So if you, if you travel through Ghana from the wet and slightly cooler north, uh, south to the, to the dry and hot north, you will go through a zone of maize production, sorghum production, millet production. So the traditional agricultural systems of the regions that are 900, 1,000 years old uh, are adapted. Of course, the maize hasn't been there for 1,000 years, but uh, they, they are adapted to the temperature and moisture regimes there. And climate change will change that very significantly. So in summary of this part, heat stress is determined by canopy temperature. More sunshine, more warmth. It can be moderated if the plant has lots of moisture, can transpire, or like in the case of, of uh, rice, actually stands in the water. Above 34 degrees, things get critical because senescence accelerates and the plant will not mature properly. Uh, up to that point, the mixes of are somewhat curvilinear or more or less linear. But once we get nearer to 40 degrees maximum, we are hitting thresholds. And other than genetic engineering, there's no way we can fiddle with those thresholds. And even with genetic engineering, the recipes are not there yet. <clears throat> so the, the uh, different agroecological zones will uh, be sensitive to these maximum temperatures. And we all know that these maxima are more extreme in the semi-arid areas in the north of Argentina, in Paraguay, uh, in the interior, uh, southern part of, of Brazil, uh, and so on, and in much of Africa. 
So those will be the regions that suffer most the effects of climate change. Superimpose that on Ines's model outputs, and you will suddenly get a different map of vulnerability and the impact of climate change. There will be differential temperature changes across the world, but these differential temperature changes will be amplified uh, through differential uh, susceptibilities and vulnerabilities. Uh, and, of course, means and maxima is something very different. Ines mentioned that as well. The maximum summer temperature change, which is what is important in terms of crop production in, in uh, Europe between 1880s and 2005, was 1.6 degrees. So we're heading for a global mean change limit of 1.5, but in terms of what the wheat sees as it matures in a European field, it's already gone beyond that. These scaling factors uh, are basically very often a factor of two. The extremes will be pushed out by two degrees for every one degree in mean temperature change. So if you think back to these curves, we're moving the mean and we're moving the extremes even further. The 2003 heat, other than the deaths in France, uh, reduced uh, Italian maize yields by 36%. European fruit harvest was down by a quarter. And wheat harvests, and even though much of the wheat was already harvested by the time the top heat hit late in, or hit in August, because it's winter wheat that gets harvested in June, July, already the rest of the warm summer reduced the wheat harvest by 22%. Now, that was only one continent. There's market forces, and the Europeans can afford to import a little more and whatever. So the impact, long-term impact, wasn't that great. Multiply that out to a couple of continents, and it already gets critical. Uh, let's look at the extreme events. I, I think this will give you an idea of, of uh, the means and uh, the susceptibilities. But one of the concerns uh, is, um, we have 25 minutes left, uh, to look at extreme events and then use the last five minutes also uh, to quickly think about what we do in, in discussions tomorrow. Uh, these are FAO statistics. Forestry, uh, uh, losses to forestry from storms. Most loss to forestry is storms. Trees fall over. That's it. Floods, droughts, relatively little impact. Crops. Huge losses from floods, much less from storms. And of course, if there's a severe drought, uh, crops are being hit as well. But crops take several months to mature, whereas an animal uh, needs fodder all the time. So if grassland production and grasslands are in drier areas, semi-arid areas, so livestock production, here droughts are the most important uh, losses. If we take these events and we add them all up, and now we put billion dollar values on this, total production losses between uh, in the 10 year period between 2003 and 13 is 70 billion dollars due to extreme events. So we're not talking about these 40 billion dollars due to creeping climate change. We're talking extreme events separated out 70 billion. So now we're already over 100 billion in the agricultural sector alone. Much of that is, uh, of course, because of crop losses, because the greater acreage, the greater area is occupied by crop or for crop production. The number of disasters by decade and hazard type from the 70s to the 2000s, the one thing that's clear is the increase, and that's why uh, 
uh, insurance values are um, interesting for looking at climate change effects. Floods account for a huge amount of that increase, and that's what we see in the news every day. There's areas flooded. Uh, the Argentine Minister of the Environment talks of apocalyptic conditions in his country. Uh, so uh, these things uh, increase tremendously, floods and storms. The rest creeps up a little bit. In terms of deaths, human deaths, uh, individual events, of course, are uh, very, very important. And what you see here is basically the drought in Africa in the 80s in East Africa. So uh, there we need to disaggregate the statistics and think carefully about what caused these differences. Uh, and, and the variability here is, is very much greater because to come to death is a more extreme event than just to have a disaster with uh, production reductions. If we look at South America and North America, particularly floods account for most of the damage, and we see a steady rise uh, through the decades. And for North America and the Caribbean, uh, floods, and of course, because we're in hurricane country, uh, storms become very important as well, which are relatively unimportant in South America. So the granularity of climate change impact is becoming very, very clear there. The Caribbean will see a different regime than Brazil or the southern cone. In the language of the IPCC, there is high confidence that heat, wa heat waves, heavy precipitation, glacial retreat, and so on and so on, permafrost degradation will increase and will cause slope instabilities, flooding, and disasters. Small islands will suffer most. Shorelines will be affected. So the IPCC has looked at all of this together and said, we are pretty confident, we are pretty confident that all of these bad things will happen and will increase in the future. And the impact will be greatest on agriculture. That's why I concentrated on agriculture, on the availability of, of water, but also on transportation, tourism, and so on. Settlement patterns uh, are important. When, if, you, if you build a house now in, in southern Florida near the shoreline, you cannot get insurance for your house anymore. Nobody will insure you. It's, it's become so obvious that between sea level rise and hurricane, uh, the risk is just simply too high. If you want to live there, fine, live there, but you can no longer insure your house. So these infrastructure developments are already being regulated by market forces and probably they will need additional regulation in, in the future. And again, the IPCC is, is talking about these exposures and vulnerabilities with, with high uh, confidence. The aging society that we heard about this morning is important because all people are more susceptible to heat waves. So it's, again, something where uh, uh, societal development and climate change will interact and make the situation worse. Uh, there is an index of preparedness to climate change that is being produced by a US a university. And um, some of the, without going into the details, they have very many categories. But the lack of innovative capacity uh, is, is very important in terms of not being able to adapt. Uh, social inequality is very important in terms of vulnerability of certain sectors to the changes and defi deficits in governance, i.e. implementing remedial action is uh, very important. So when we look at climate change, the social and economic and political problems that we see in regions like Latin America will stick out even more. The lack of governmental activity action and capacity to address these problems will become more and more important. So uh, the protest over that lack will become more and more important. So climate change will have direct effects on political governance issues in countries that are missing the boat in terms of adapting uh, 
and developing appropriate responses to climate change. And that is something that is very important in Latin America, but also in many other regions, coping versus adapting. When Hurricane Mitch uh, hit Nicaragua, most, <clears throat> most households, even the poor households, somehow coped. Right? They rebuilt their little hut. They, they, they uh, found their pig in the bush or whatever. Somehow they coped with the event and avoided extreme poverty. But they were set back to such a degree and there was no government policy in place to translate that into a development step so that these people are basically for many years in the future excluded from social development. And if you have to cope again and cope again, your coping capacity gets less. So uh, even though some of these extreme events have not caused all these deaths and the people are still there and they're still coping, we cannot rely on that coping capacity to be the same in the future unless there is a real adaptation policy for the future. We need adaptation. But adaptation requires knowledge, understanding, learning, as well as the resources to adapt. That is a very complex uh, 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 mechanism that we need to put in place. And part of the reasons for this class for this course is to inject some of these ideas into academia and say, okay, this learning, knowledge, and resource process needs to be supported by all sectors of society, including academia. One of the key words that's come out recently is the no regret strategies. If you think about it, development policy, improving infrastructure, building better bridges, building better communications lines, all of these things make it easier to cope with disasters and extreme events. Yes, there's more real estate out there that can be wiped away by an extreme event, but a, a strategy that combines development goals, better health care provisions, uh, better education, better early warning systems, and so on, that are essentially fundamental development goals helps also to deal with climate change. So in order to make the investment more palatable uh, to deal with uh, or reduce vulnerability under climate change, these no regret strategies are being increasingly promoted in the political dialogue because yes, you spend money, but the money is spent on development. And by the way, it also helps to uh, prepare for climate change. So aiming at win-win uh, situations is uh, the critical point there. And this is uh, a translation of this. Single loop learning is you get a flood, well, I'll put the dike a little higher and hopefully the next flood won't happen. That's that's a single loop that's very easy, direct, knee-jerk reaction. I hit him on the knee and the uh, foot jerks. Double loop learning, well, maybe we have to think a little deeper. Uh, whoop. What strategies could I put uh, into place in order to regulate river flow between one watershed and another, or uh, between one country or another, between one region and another? How can I reduce general vulnerability of the population under climate change? How do I, how do I make climate smart infrastructure? And then the triple uh, loop learning, uh, what resource management policies do I need to put in place in order to enshrine such reactions in society? to make climate change part of the policy of the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Public Works, the Ministry of Science and Technology, and so on and so on. So that is a, a, a little bit what we need to aim for from the knee-jerk reaction to a direct crisis to <coughs> exploring more and more of the context and causing transformations 
to deal with future crises. So that's it. In summary, uh, there are clear reasons why we should not expect nice, predictable, linear effects of climate change from basic enzymes, plant responses, productivities, as well as uh, the climate variability and the relationship, the non-linear -rela relationship between extremes and means, we cannot expect linearities. There are biophysical reasons for that. And that means that there are biophysical reasons for aiming at the lowest possible Paris delta T. Two degrees is, well, if you can't do any better, one degree, one and a half degrees is better, and the lower we can keep it, uh, the better it is. In my opinion, these thresholds are just simply to put a number on the page and be able to print it in a newspaper. But there is a transition process between these numbers that we need to manage as effectively as possible. Social uh, and, and governance social systems and governance need to adapt to that and need to respond of that, to that. So the task that we have is convince decision makers, and that's where we come to the monetization issues that we talked about yesterday. Uh, we, we have to convince uh, governors or governance to put the money aside in order to mitigate and adapt now, even in the absence of possible final equations and drawing a line and saying, well, that's the outcome in dollars and cents at the end. It will not work out. But if we don't do it, these nonlinearities that we've seen <coughs> in responses and the fact that all of this has been going on for 20 and 25 years, it's, in retrospect, it's clear now. It wasn't clear when the first models, climate models, came out. There was an inkling there that something is happening. Now we know something is already happening. And as we move towards one and a half and two degrees, more will be happening. So these are the, the issues that we need to deal with. Thank you very much. Um, so I have a couple questions, or just kind of points. Um, so in regards to temperature and the biosphere, um, I think the thing that's important to stop and think about is that the biosphere is, is experiencing a more specific temperature than just global temperature changes, right? So I use tower data over every plant functional type, every Köppen-Geiger climate region, and every um, biome, essentially. And over uh, since the beginning of the data record, 1991, the biosphere has actually seen a 1.8 degrees Celsius warming. Um, and that's because we're not taking into account the biosphere isn't seeing the thermal inertia of the oceans and things like that. Um, so it's an absolutely shocking number. Um, but it's what the biosphere is actually seeing right now. And that's, it makes the temperature projections so much more scary. Um, that's my first point. And then, so... Um, <coughs> I've done a lot of work generating the temperature response curves of photosynthesis and, and crop yield. Um, and I have curves on my poster here for C3 and C4 photosynthesis. Um, and I wanted to make two main points about temperature for crop yields and the biosphere. Um, the first is that plants um, essentially set their um, inflection point, the point where they are maximally increasing photosynthesis or yield um, right at annual mean temperature because they want to be in this maximum growing space in their growing season. But that annual temperature range often ex extends far past, or well, right now extends just to T max, which is that, that maximum point. But literally within the last decade, tower data ac around the world has moved us past T max a couple of degrees. And it's incredibly scary because it, it means that any additional warming increases the amount of time that we spend past T max, 
which means that photosynthesis and crop yield are declining. And so increasing portions of the year will be in that rapid decline, which is exactly the data that you were, um, that you're, that you're presenting here today. Um, but it's actually also seen at a global scale now. And it's incredibly alarming. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, obviously, um, the, the, the points that I was trying to make in, in, in uh, referring to maximum summer temperatures being much more extreme than the averages, in the winter, the plants certainly in the northern hemisphere or closer to the poles are dormant anyway. So they don't see what's happening, whether it's a little warmer or a little colder. And, and what the biosphere sees is the extremes now. And as, that's why I emphasized that important range above 30 degrees. Uh, many of the plants, including tropical plants, uh, are limited by simply the biochemistry that plants have. And once we get past that point of 30 degree, we're screwed. And I think the thing that's the most scary about that is those are some of the most productive biomes in the world, right? Those biomes cycle so much carbon. And, and, and my data suggests exactly the same thing, that tropical rainforests, tropical ecosystems in general, may be the first to crash because they're already so close to that ultimate temperature tipping point of photosynthesis. Yeah, we, we've, we've seen some of this in the revegetation experiments in the, in the eastern Amazon uh, and, and the scary stories about the savannization of the Amazon rainforest. Now, there were many biotic factors like pollination, like seed dispersal and so on that affected that story. But at the root of it, there is also the local microclimate change that is you take that canopy away your local soil temperatures and environmental temperatures simply exceed the biologically tolerable, and therefore you cannot establish, re-establish the vegetation that you've lost. Just to add a bit on that, uh, working? Yeah. Um, it's that all this process can be seen as a biome shift in natural vegetation, isn't it? So uh, just recent research about the, um, the border forest showed that somehow until since 1990 or since 1980s, the, the, the carbon sink was sort of going up. So photosynthesis was being higher than respiration. In, in, and so the biome was acting as a sink of CO2. But that rate uh, has sort of slow, slowed down in the, in the last, I think, um, 10 years or so. And that is due basically to um, one hypothesis that uh, the, the shielding requirement uh, are not being met. Somehow uh, the biome needs an amount of cold. So because the, 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 the warming all year round, especially in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the frozen season, uh, is sort of, uh, they are falling short of, of cold as well. So it's, it's a complex somehow. That's, that's what these graphs were showing, that as the minimum temperature increases, sometimes the yield response, the negative yield response is, is the strongest, uh, much more so than to the maximum, depending on what region you're in. And again, it's the granularity. Some plants, of course, are better adapted. Uh, some of the cactuses and so on are, are quite happy at very high temperatures because they basically shut down. But unless you're prepared to live on tequila, it's not really an option. Uh, uh, for agricultural production. Um, can you move one step up? Another one, another one. It's there, there, fine. No, 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 come back, one, one step, good. Uh, I think uh, tomorrow, because we're such a large group, uh, we need uh, to divide the group. And this is approximately half, so this is one division. And she's approximately half, so anybody above her, uh, there is a quarter group, there is a quarter group, and here are the other groups. I think that's the easiest way, just, just orient yourself on, on these lines. And uh, tomorrow, uh, these four groups should uh, try and discuss some of the issues uh, that we have seen here. <clears throat> 
uh, and give on a, on a single page at the end of the morning a uh, reasoning to a public, to a politician as to what you think about a two degree limit and a 1.5 degree limit about vulnerabilities and our ability to control temperatures and climate change and to adapt to temperatures and climate change. These are balancing acts. And uh, tomorrow we'll meet as a group again. We can rediscuss that task for about 20 minutes or so in the morning and maybe put a more specific topic for each of these groups. If you want to think about a, a specific topic, discuss it on the bus, discuss it over a beer in the evening or with a foro or wherever you go, and, and come up with an idea tomorrow morning, uh, then we can uh, possibly implement that. And if you don't have any ideas, we will give you ideas. So you have the freedom to choose your own, or otherwise we will give you something tomorrow. So these four groups uh, tomorrow uh, we'll discuss some of the implications of what you've heard today, what you've heard yesterday in terms of uh, different biomes and, and, and biodiversity roles and what you've heard before in the week that I don't know. 5.30, I think the buses are there. Stay there. Stay there. Thank you, Professor Holm. Thank you very much, Injit.